Okay, so this is called Smoke Mirror Chrome. This is the uh, powder coating you put on this. The nice thing about powder coating is you can do a nice clean surface. You put some powder coat on it, you throw it into an oven. When it comes out, it is essentially bulletproof. Um, this is one of the situations where the brake boosters in this car that these are going in were perfectly workable. No real justification in placing them. However, the booster units look a little tired. So this is what we like to do. We just do a little powder coat on them and we're done with it. Now, if you are one who's thinking about buying a powder coating system, there's nothing wrong with that idea. However, do not use your home oven. Get a sacrificial oven. I went to a restaurant supply place and I bought a small little used convection oven and I paid like 80 bucks for it. And I've had it for at least 10 years now and I've gotten my money way out of it. Okay, so if you're gonna do something like this, if you're gonna powder coat, great idea. You like the, the little things that you, you either don't want to paint or paint's not durable enough. You know what you can use it for. You've probably got a million ideas right now which you would use it for. We're using it for this. We use it for a lot of little things. Yes, he's supposed to be the gold CAD coating, but in this particular case, it doesn't really matter because the owner of the car is not going for an authentic original touch. Now, but again, I want to emphasize one thing one more time. If you do like to do powder coating, do not use your home oven. The, the uh, toxins that come off of this permeate the oven and it will eventually make you very sick if you eat food out of the oven that you're powder coating in. So don't do it. Okay, this is our powder coating oven. Again, bought this fairly inexpensively at a, uh, a restaurant supply place. It was a used one um, and it's done wonders. We've had it for a very long time and it's never given me a moment's trouble. Um, powder coating is a great way to preserve parts that either A, you don't have the ability to paint or B, paint won't be durable enough to for a finish. Um, however, you are compromising one thing. You're not going to have the original look in many cases. I'm powder coating the brake booster parts that were not smoke mirror chrome in color. They were obviously gold CAD coated. Um, so in this case, yeah, we're not being authentic or correct, but however, we are putting a very durable finish that the brake fluid is not going to mess up if it gets on. Okay, this is a LED conversion that we've done on this car. This has kind of become really common practice with us anymore. Uh, people like the idea of having a clearer vision of what's going on to the driver behind them. Okay, so what we've done, here's a, a normal uh, tail light assembly. You can see that the bulb, the bulb will go in sideways. It will reflect off the doming out. It would be a single filament bulb and your illumination would be fairly good but not nearly as focused as these can deliver. So what we do is we relocate the cradle behind and we install these. Now this is a 19 and a 19. You can get them slightly bigger, you can get them all the way up to a 35, but that's a pretty huge LED. But the point is, is, is the, the um, retrofitting your, your tail light assembly is not that big a job. Um, and it gives you all that much more opportunity to have a more safe, experience in your car, especially when it comes to the tailgater behind you, because you all know, as well as I do, it's a much different world now than it's ever been before, with everybody driving with their phones, texting, and looking at the internet, and doing whatever they do in their car while they're driving. At least we're giving ourselves a fighting chance of them clearly seeing us. So now I'm going to show you the difference between a 19 uh, LED unit and a 35 LED unit. And it's really, what's nice about this is you create what you want to happen on the back side of your car. Now normally this is supposed to be the turn signal, the brake lights down here, and the nighttime operation lights down here. And in this case that's what's going to maintain, but however on the next car I'm going to show you, we decided to use the upper for the brake lights. The reason we did that is because the rear end of these cars sits so low, and it's hard sometimes for people to be very aware of what your intentions are. When the brake light even lower, it's kind of hard to notice sometimes. Tailgates are out there. Somebody's going to be tailgating you no matter what. And when you go through the expensive restore in a car, you become extra agitated when somebody's you know, tailgating you. So, with that said, now this is... That's in, that is going in this car. This is going to be the turn signal. You 
can see it's a very sharp, very intense focus light, and you can see quite clearly. Now the next one, that is the brake light. Again, these are 19 and 19, meaning 19 LED units. And then the nighttime operation light, slightly less uh, illuminated. And that's how this car is going to be. Now, let me show you what the 35 and 19 look like. When you think about this for a second, this is an all aluminum conversion car. There is substantial expense associated with this car. And of course, the owner of this car, last thing in the world he wants is somebody to rear end this car. But let me show you what we decided to do with this car. That's a 35 LED bulb. That's the brake light. We decided to move the brake light up top to sit down low. Again, because the rear end of this car is sitting so low, we want to make sure somebody behind us is very, very clearly understanding what we're doing. So our turn signal is now moved down below. But again, see the brightness of that 35 LED bulb? It is substantially brighter than the other car. I like the idea. I don't see a problem with converting these into an LED situation, especially when you can get much more saturated light without blinding the person behind you, but getting their attention much more, uh, obviously, than you would have with the regular bulb. call this car what not to do. Um, we started on this car a long time ago. We did the outside of the car and when it's all said and done it was decided to uh, try to do something with the engine bay because the outside of the car was looking great the engine bay was looking really tired. For whatever reason it was elected to not pull the motor and transmission and properly bring the engine bay up to the standards. So it becomes a little bit of a, a daunting task at that point to do something about it after the fact because you don't want to be reaching over the painting and surface and dealing with all this. However, we did and we're here now. Now you saw me a, a little bit ago powder coating parts, powder coated the valve cover, powder coated the booster parts. The reason we powder coated them instead of anything else is because is because what we found was that you know the brake boosters for the most part were actually in good shape. It's just that the the gold cat coated housings were um, exhausted. So, you know, we decided to make a positive out of it. We powder coated it with this uh, smoke mirror texture along with the valve cover so it all so, along with the cam cover so it all kind of has a working thing. We repainted and put new decals on the original airbox. Painted the radiator. You see we cleaned it up quite a bit in here. However, this is where we come to the public service announcement. When we started to pull all this apart, this entire area was completely contaminated with brake fluid. So we had to power wash this and sand it and then put a epoxy down before we could paint it. Okay, so in the process of dismantling this car to prepare the engine bay for painting, we ran into a few things that I guess it was a good thing we decided to do this. Um, this is kind of a common problem that we run into all the time. The brake reservoir and the clutch reservoir um, on these three cars are not hard lined in. They are attached via flex line. All too commonly do we find fuel lines being used or even worse, vacuum lines being used. Neither of these are chemical resistant enough for brake fluid. The vacuum line is what completely contaminated all this. Somebody could use a vacuum line in lieu of proper brake fluid line. And it was leaking. This is very gummy. And the rubber is completely liquid. See, just touching that, the rubber's coming off my hands. This is an exceptionally dangerous idea because not only is it going to inevitably leak and leak quickly, but if you run out of fluid on the brakes, how are you stopping the car, right? Whereas we think fuel line's okay, but it actually is not. It has the same kind of problem. It is, gate it is uh, rated to handle petroleum, but it's not rated to handle something as highly acidic as brake fluid. So this also becomes gummy and starts to chew up on the ends and it starts to leak. So it leaves us with what we're supposed to have, which is 
this. This is uh, the, the, the proper brake fluid reservoir line. It can be somewhat difficult to get. You can buy it from your obvious, your obvious suppliers, but it's also somewhat expensive. It's about nine bucks a foot. Um, and if you don't know what to ask for, you're not going to be able to find it at a part store because part stores don't normally carry this. This is unique to them as well. But what you need to know is this is made, first of all, it's blue, made by Continental, and it is a reservoir line. If you ask that, theoretically, you should be able to find it. Um, the, the most important parameter of this stuff is that it needs to be able to withstand brake fluid as its agent is traveling through. That's a specific what it's designed for. Anyway, so in the process of the build, the first thing you yeah, really, really want to do if you're restoring cars, you want to pull the engine out, the motor out, you want, to, you want to get everything out of the engine bay, you want to completely decontaminate the engine bay. This is probably the first thing you want to paint. However, in this car, this was the last thing you I'm not a fan of it. We didn't pull the motor, although we will be able to finish up some of the painting you can't see it that's underneath from the lift. Um, this is not exactly the most ideal way of doing it, and I would not suggest you do so. Um, you know that the engine base can be painted, and you don't want to see the labor of doing the motor and the top of this, then I wouldn't start until you did. Because quite honestly, um, who wants to pull the motor out of a freshly painted car? Because if you chip or scratch or dent the car, it's a lot of work to fix that versus doing this first and building the rest of the car around it. basic thing I shared with you was a few years ago. Um, this being my car and us driving it throughout the summer, working out the little quirks and making it more of what it should be, there's things that need to be corrected on this car as well. Sometimes these things happen after it's been settled in, breaking in, so to speak. Because when you take, when you think about this, you take a car that's been off the road for almost 40 years and you go through the, the painstaking efforts of building it and you adjust things the best you can. At times, because it's still a 40-year-old car, things are going to sudden in and need to be readjusted. And that's where we're at here. Now, one of the things we're going to talk about is the door sills. In the last 10, 15 years that I can remember, there's been at least three different iterations of manufacturing on the door sills. The new old stock original stuff ran out a long time ago. That was by far the most superior door sill that you could purchase, and still stands up as probably the best that you could have had. It was a softer, more compliant rubber. It yielded very well against the door, and it didn't modify the door's pressing. Now, when those ran out of stock, somebody went into production on them and they made another version of them. The version they made 10 plus years ago wasn't really a pure rubber. It was probably more of a synthetic blend of rubber. They were hard. It, when you shut the door, you had to really slam the door in order for it to shut. And then the door edge would push out. The windows oftentimes were you know, not willing to rest up against the sill because it was so dug on hard. It made a very heavy cranking up and rolling down in the window. Everything changed with that sill. But you effectively didn't have a choice for at least five years. And then somebody came out with a, an improved version of that door sill. And it was a little bit softer, a little bit better, but not by a whole lot. Maybe it was a little more rubber, but I, my suspicions are it's probably more of a different kind of synthetic blend. Now the original manufacturers come back into play. Now they're making the new door sills. The new door sills work in almost every way. However, at some point in time, somebody has made the door sills slightly smaller for easy shutting. To me, 
as great as that is an idea, it could be masking another problem. It could be masking a problem if the door is not aligned properly or maybe there's a little bit of flex in the chassis. Who knows? But the point is, is if you had an original set of door sills at the original diameter, which was slightly bigger, why shouldn't they fit? Why shouldn't the door shut easily? So that's what we're going to address. Now, one of the things we're going to talk about today is we're going to talk about the window pitch. There is an adjustment here and here to pitch this window. Okay, The front of this is fine. It seals up against the door quite well. However, the back of this has moved over time and it's away from the door. Is that that big a deal? Yeah, it is. Um, not so much because of the uh, prevention of the noise and the elements, but effectively this is affecting the drivability. This affects the experience of the car. When you roll up the windows, you expect the car to be a little more quiet. Why shouldn't you expect those things? Well, that door sill, window relationship, isn't very tight. I don't mean crushing, I just mean where they're in full contact. Then you're getting excessive noise in the car, and that does affect the overall driving experience. So we're going to talk about pitching that window. The other thing we're going to talk about is the relationship of the latch height adjustment, which we talked about before, the striker engagement to the receiver, and how all that needs to work in a very fluid manner. You need to make these adjustments without a door sill in. If you don't have a solid baseline, when you put a door sill on, you're competing not only with the relationship of everything, but now you're competing against the tightness of the door sill against the door. Door card off is a plus. Uh, window, excuse me, door sill off is a must. Okay, so the reason we have all this out of the way is so I have access to the window pitch, I have access to the adjustment of the uh, striker relationship, and we have a few other things we're going to talk about. You'll see how that goes in a minute. So let's get started. The first thing we're going to talk about is how is the actual engagement of the door to the striker. I have to hit that all the way up. There's two latching systems here, okay? Okay, you see it. That's the safety latch engaged right now, so of the two latchings, only the leading edge one is engaged. If I put a little effort to it, the second one is now engaged. I have no gap. Okay, so I had to fully height this up in order to get this to clear the actual latching. That in itself is already a problem, so we need to compensate for that in, in some positive way. The other thing is, you see how much gap I have before I'm hitting the strike? That is too early. The reason that is a relevant statement is because as a striker, as this is so far down right now, if it's hitting the receiver early, that means it's going to carry up and constantly go up, 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 up until it gets over the latching system. That means you're driving the door to shut. I shouldn't have to do that. It should be a fairly smooth shut on its own. I had to put a little bit of effort into that. The least resistance you get out of this story right now, the better it's going to be when you try to put a door seal in and compete against all that. What we don't want is a door that we have to slam shut and then when we go to open it up, it pops open like a jack-in-the-box. That is a bound-up system that's not working. Okay, so again, everything's going to change when we put the door sill on. So we want this relationship, flushness, easy to shut, window alignment. We want all that to be done before we put a seal in because the seal should not influence the door's shutting capability. It should only make it a smooth, tight seal. Now, my other problem is... This is coming engaged with the vertical sill and it's becoming a little bit of a problem to get past it and to open it. It's a minor issue, but it is still an issue that I need to address. Is my sill pushed out too much? We don't know yet. We'll have to figure that out. But the first thing's first. We're going to stay on task here. The relationship of our striker to the latch, that needs to be better. It is poor right now at best. Okay, so I'm going to adjust for that first. Now. If I loosen this up and I push it forward, it raises this from this angle up, okay? The problem with that is, is if that's your choice, is if you raise it up too much, the safety latch doesn't come engaged. So you have a couple of options. One, if you can get the receiver to come down, 
that's great. However, there's something you need to know. If that receiver to come down, if your door, top of the door, doesn't line up top of the quarter panel, you already have a problem with the whole door itself, and the door may need to be raised, or you may have hinge issues. Okay, so you have to assess the total picture before you make all these minor changes. Okay, so right now, that doesn't shut too bad. It didn't require a whole lot of effort, but it's still, it's a little more than I want it to be. So we're going to make some adjustments here. And I still don't like how high I have to lift this and pull on it to get it to open. So I'm going after that problem first. I want to find out how much of an influence this is. Boy, that shut real smooth. And it opens fairly better, too. Well, the good news is, is I'm thinking I'm only going to make this adjustment up a little bit. And I bet you that's going to cure most of that problem. However, this problem, I need to make something happen with this because <clears throat> apparently this is pushed out too far and it's influencing the striker's engagement to the, to the latch. Okay, so my adjustment for this is right here. I'm going to listen it up and show you what it looks like. Okay, now watch this. See how that moves? By me moving this forwards and backwards, this hikes and lowers. Again, you don't want to necessarily do this by moving this forwards and backwards. This piece right, this piece right here. And that goes up and down. However, you don't want to make this as an essential, you don't want to make this a part of your absolute adjustments if the first latching no longer engages. That is a safety latch. It is a critical thing to have happen. Okay, so I think I've made about all the adjustments I'm willing to make. As you can see, the door is flush here, respectful there. It doesn't require a whole lot of hiking up to get it to open. Okay, and I'm going to partially shut it. That's the safety latch. It's grabbing. That's the first thing we need to confirm. Slight amount of effort, and the thing fully latches. I'm done with the adjustment of this portion of it. Now, however, there's one other thing you should know. I'm going to make an adjustment right now because... I still have to bring it all the way to a full open in order for this to release. There's one other adjustment I can make. On the back side of this, there is a stem that comes down onto the striker arm. You can adjust it down and create more contact in the dead play. The dead play is this. I move that about a half an inch and this doesn't even move yet. Whereas if I adjust that stem down and get an early engagement, which means this will clear, the striker a little bit earlier. You want some dead play, okay, because you don't want that to be a difficult thing for you to assess whether the door is locked or not. So a little bit of dead play is a good thing, a lot of dead play is not so much. Okay, so I'm going to split the difference of what's there. It's about a half inch, so I'm going to adjust it down to get about a quarter inch of dead play, and then that's going to make this much easier to open. Why is this so important? The bracket that this bolts to that's behind here can't take a whole lot of abuse. It can't take a whole lot of hyperextending. If the handle itself is starting to crack in the pot metal, that's because you know it has been stressed too much and it will snap. And of course you can get replacements of these, but if it's not broke, why put it in a situation where it will be broke? So the bracket that's behind here won't take a whole lot of stress. So if you have to put a lot of energy lifting this up, you're going to bust the paint around the bottom of this. And that is a tragic thing because in order for you to repair the paint somewhere around here, the whole door ends up having to be painted. So that's an excessive extent of um, repair costs you could avoid if you just adjust the doors. So again, closes very easily. I don't need a whole lot of effort to do that. And that's what I was looking for because again, once you put the gasket on, we need to solve gasket problem, not a relationship of everything else at the same time. So how we do this, in this particular case, we raise the angle of this up a little bit by adjusting right here, 22 millimeter 
nut that's on the arm. You slide it forward, it raises this up. Okay, so we create a little bit of raise there. We made sure this does not come engaged to the latch too early. Okay, that's pretty good. If I got about that much before I get a connection, that's what I want. Okay, and also we don't want this to determine the door shutting. You don't want this to influence it. You want it to just be simply a guide, not something that's lifting the door up or pushing the door down to shut it. Okay, so again, for me to be that early, here we are in the first latch light amount of effort, very little effort, and it shuts all the way tightly, flush, and clean. Now I know when I go to put my seal on that this same action needs to happen just with a little bit more energy because I do want my door to press against the seal. I don't want it to crush the seal. There is a difference. Okay. Now you can see right about now if you have door seals that are the, the early reproductions which are that rock hard rubber, it's an uphill battle. You may never get this to work right. Okay, and the idea of it breaking in and yielding and being compliant later, it's not going to happen. Weather affects it, so it'd be very hard for you to shut your doors in the winter because that rubber synthetic blend becomes very hard, and it may be a little easier in the summer. But effectively, it's still going to be one of those deals where you're in the parking lot, you got a club event or something, and you're banging the heck out of your door to get it to shut. You don't need to do that. Solve the problem. So again, I'm happy with the way that is. I'm done with the adjustments. Now we're gonna move on to the next phase of problems. But this one is solved. Okay, so let's open this up so we can see. Let's review a little bit of what you gotta do. So we made adjustments on the latching and the striker to make sure they were about as minimal resistance to one another without the gasket in. And then we put in a gasket. Now this is the, one of those second iteration gaskets. I mean, they're a little bit softer than the first reproductions, but not quite as nice as the new ones that are out now. So you're probably gonna have a whole lot less struggles to get these things to work for you if you buy the newer ones. But again, so in review, we make sure that our latching to striker matches up with minimal resistance and no gasket in place. Your adjustments are here. Moving this back and forth, raises and lowers the pitch on the, on the cleat. You can adjust here as well if you need be. But when you have the gaskets and everything out of the way, as you bring the door close in, you should not have an early greeting of the striker to the latch. It should be somewhere with about a half an inch or so of the door sticking out. That's only when we start to feel the contact come into play. It shouldn't come into play as soon as the door comes even close. Something's not right. Also, pay attention that you're not seeing the door lift up onto the striker. That could be one of a couple of situations. You could have hinges that are completely done and need to be rebuilt. Or you can have a striker and latching system that's way out of alignment and it's forcing the door to act in unnatural characteristics. Now, with that said, again, before gasket goes in, you want to make sure that the pitch, which is adjustable here on the window, and back here on the window, you want to make sure the window pitch is just right to where it's in contact with the sill, but not crushing the sill. Okay, so those are your primary things you need to address. And then at that point, you can put the sill in and double check all of it. Now you expect the sill to create some resistance, but it shouldn't be this unbelievable amount of force to shut your door. If that's the case, you have something wrong or the sill is just not right. That's about all I can tell you on that. 